and that is us live. Hello, welcome back um, to our third episode um, of our podcast stroke video diary news and things, which we are currently coining uh, Toby and Scott Discuss. Oof, gripping title there for you. Um, hello, Scott, how are you? Hello, uh, Toby, I'm well, thank you. Uh, this Good. week we are going to be doing the Langoliers. We are. Which is part which is, one uh, of uh, anthology he did of novellas. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is one of four. Yeah, books. first one in the book. Right. Um, it's fairly unknown. Yeah, I, I, I relatively so many people who have heard of it. It's not massive. You don't when you think of Stephen King, you don't think oh Langoliers. No, but then I, I would argue none. Well, I actually was going to say I could argue that you uh, none of his novellas really you don't put with Stephen King, and technically that's true. But also some of the biggest and best films that people regard as classics are Stephen King novels, like Stand by Me and Shawshank Redemption. But would you, right. when you say that, you don't necessarily think of oh, Stephen King. Unless you're a Stephen no. King fan. Some people are quite shocked to find out that Stephen King wrote Rita Hayward in The Shawshank Redemption. Which and I'm even sure. The Lawnmower Man. And The Lawnmower Man, yeah. Yeah, I guess those ones are given a lot of freedom to run. Yeah. They're shorter ones. So yeah, he, he, um, he isn't really renowned for his novellas, the shorts, but they made really good films. I right, think. and he has done a lot of them. He's got... Yeah quite a few short story books and can you name them all without looking them up say again can you name them all without looking them up his short story collections no i can't okay 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 here we go different seasons night shift skeleton crew is skeleton crew a novella book i think it's skeleton key yeah okay skeleton key no i'm not sure i have that's the one i have read I yeah. should know. That is, yeah. that is short stories, though, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, before, just after sunset, um, four past midnight, full dark, no stars, bizarre of bad dreams, nightmare and dreamscapes. And the new one. Yeah, if it bleeds. Which we should... We should review, I guess. We should review like his latest one sometime. Yeah, that, that's probably actually quite a good idea. Happy. If you want to get viewers in and stuff like that. <laughs> right. you no. Share with your friends. Like and subscribe. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> They'll do the books he wrote 50 years ago. Smooth <laughs> transition. Mm. Yes. Okay, so yeah, we're doing Four Past Midnight, which is the second of novellas? No, third of his novellas. Okay. Oh. Like he does, the, the editions I have, he often... Each story has a little backstory. Like when I read Skeleton Crew, there was at least a page on where that's from and where it came from. Mm -hmm. And similar to this one, it seems like he doesn't write to have a book of novellas. He just writes some stories that he doesn't know what to do with. Yeah, kind of. Then he, he finds a way to sort of stick some that fit together. And he is them. quite a fan of the short story form as well. Yeah, and. Uh, I've, I've read up enough of him to know that often it feels like he's testing things out, like certain themes, uh, mm -hmm. rhyming sayings, characters will kind of come back in, in larger book form. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But yes, let's do the Langoliers. Which the we Langoliers. Yeah, it's, it's not the best name. So oh, a little bit, just a quickly, just a history of my reading with the Langoliers. I read it between, well, the, over the last two weeks, I'm very fresh from reading this. You've read it recently, haven't you? Like the last year or so, I think. I think I read it the week before you. That's why oh, I was okay. it, because I knew it was. Yeah. Well, there you go, well within the last year. Um, <laughs> so we're both really fresh on this. Mm. Um, and, oh, magnific. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was a TV movie made of this. <laughs> Which I also watched very recently. And see, I do have a bit more history. I think I watched this when I was young. Mm, I, I remember seeing it when I was young, but not like for any 
Right. I think I stayed up late on a Sunday night and it came on and it just filled that spot perfectly. And <laughs> amazingly, I think, as you said, somehow it's three hours long. Yeah. It, it, but it, it is two uh, parts of a mini series. The devil. Right. It's a short story. So the story in the book, there's the length of the book for viewers. Mm -hmm. That is pretty much the length of the story plus a small introduction. So it's not a massive story. It's about 300 words, mate. Uh, 300 pages. That's a really short story. <laughs> um, yeah, 300 pages, just under. But it, it, but it reads fast as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah, it reads pages, really quickly. It's kind of a good length for a book, but this, yeah. this is one of his that just goes quick. Um, yeah. There's always something happening. They're always moving forward. Mm. Um, well, not as the case, maybe. <laughs> do you, so, the open plot, uh, should we just go into plot? Yeah, yeah. Because for a short novel, there is a lot of characters. There's, there is a lot of characters. You don't necessarily need to, you need to know everybody. But they no, but to play. they are fun. Yeah, um, oh, there's, some, there's some cracking characters in there. Okay, um, why don't you take us through the plot and I'll, I'll interject. Okay, so... Um, it's about a pilot um, who has just recently landed at Boston, I believe, um, and has just had a hairy flight. So he's a bit shaken. Um, he's had some trouble with at home. He's recently got divorced um, and that sort of thing. So uh, they arrive, they land, and there's a knock on the cabin, and this guy comes in and goes, can I have a word with you? Um, got some bad news. And it turns out his wife's just died in a accident at home i think it was a fire um right. and so he then has to get what they call a dead head or a he'll be a dead head but a red eye flight back from <laughs> boston to la that mm -hmm. night to be back and sort out all the, the things that need sorting out with this recently this is wife. uh this is brian engel yes Engel, not Eagle, right? It's not two on the nose. Oh, well, Brian Eng Engel is in the character. Yes, yes, that is Brian Engel, yeah. Right. Sorry, you'll have to do I the character names. I can't remember. <laughs> them. Um, so he then gets on another flight straight out as a, as, a, as a passenger. And he's in first class, I think, or maybe, yeah, probably first class. All the other passengers get on. There's a selection of people. Like The plane is relatively full, not bursting, but pretty full. Mm -hmm takes off everything goes well um he falls asleep and then shortly after um he is awoken by the screams of a blind girl who was one of the passengers um and he goes to sort of find out what's going on by but by, by moving he realizes that while he's been asleep something's happened on the plane um because most of the passengers and all of the staff have gone, vanished. And the plane is still in the air, still flying, but everybody else is gone. Um, right. From him and this blind girl. And then as it transpires, there's a few more characters still on the plane, but they, um, who are also asleep. Right, so we're in this um, kind of ghost, ghost plane scenario. Yes. And we see that fun, uh, so the blind girl, uh, Dinah, Dana? Dina. Dana. Dana. You get her point of view, which is kind of fun. She sort of wakes yes. up and yes, grabs yes. stuff, yes. and everything's been left behind. Mm, like so not only are people so missing, chairs but and purses, wallets are missing. And she basically grabs a a wig, which yeah. she thinks is a scalp, <laughs> and screams yeah. the plane down. It's really good, actually, that that section where you where you experience it through the not well through the eyes or through the, the senses of the blind girl right because what he does really well is he gives you a snapshot of each character um ex experiences of how they where they were just before they were asleep um and all that sort of thing what they were thinking of or dreaming of and all that, um, so right right really nice insight into some of the characters i i do have a lot more to say on dana but we'll we'll get to that as we come across it so she's um so yeah, so they got Brian Engel, you got Dana, then you got another guy called Don Gaffney. Right. Um, Which one? Wakes up. He's he's a, he's a, he's yeah. So I'll run I'll quickly run through the character names I can remember. So these are the people that are left on the plane. Um, obviously the pilot Brian Engel, Dana the blind girl, Don Gaffney. Um, oh crikey, 
What's his than... MO, the Don Gaffney guy? Is he the violinist or is he the... No, that, that's Albert, the violinist, isn't it? Okay, right. The, yeah. the, the, guy. Violinist. the student violinist is Albert. Then you've got Bethany, who's just like this girl who is running away, I believe, from something. Is she the you know, teenager? Yeah, the teenager, the one that gets with Albert at the end. Um, right. Then you've got um, Nick Hopewell, who's the English spy secret agent, who's right. brilliantly in the TV movie. Um, <laughs> um, he is English. <laughs> yeah, you will be reminded that he is English. Yeah. Okay. Um, often. Uh, what else? Um, who else? Sorry. Uh, oh, how could you forget Craig of Toomey? <laughs> Craig Toomey. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the nemesis to the whole entire people that are on the plane. Um, absolute back cake. Right. Yeah. Um, this is another thing I have strong thoughts on, but we will, yeah. we will get to this. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's, uh, there's one other guy who's a writer. I can't remember what his name is. Right, is it uh, Bob? Bob, yes, Bob. Yeah, there's a mirror of, um, I, I think the blind girl quickly latches on to a teacher. Yes, yeah. Uh, and she has a, not strange, but, do you she's know when... She's up and running away to meet some guy, isn't she, from, on a dating agent? Yeah, she, it's sort of manifest that she is answering to the personal ad. Mm -hmm. And I guess in this day and age, you kind of shrug that. Yeah. But when this book was written, this is before uh, I'm imagining that was pretty pioneering of pre-date um, yeah. apps. And such it things. wasn't a big thing back then. Yeah, they it, they don't really say explicit if she's literally going to meet a man for sex, like no. just having a fancy one night fling. Just falling in love with texts, basically the ideal the ideal of a man. Right. Okay. Yeah, but she's pretty shy about that for most of the book yeah. because yeah. she's yes, she's embarrassed that she's lying about it. She doesn't know. Um, so anyway, yeah. we've got all these people. They're on this plane and everybody else has disappeared. And all that's left is like false teeth, um, coins, handbags, mm. purses, wigs. That's right, it's not just things they could have left behind. It's, no. I think they think they find a pacemaker, right? Yeah, there's a pacemaker, there's the molars of somebody's jawline. Right, right. Um, all of it, just all those tangible bits left mm -hmm. behind. But their clothes, for some reason, go. Yes. Really explain, but because so because their first instinct is that they landed they landed one yeah. of them woke up and they just they just took off again yeah and it's all part and of the government conspiracy and right right there's a lot of um different reactions mm -hmm. so again. they all get together and they're having this big sort of like oh my god what's happened where is everybody in panicking and then they sort of uh, this like calm settles in and then the pilot goes i need to go and check and he goes up to the front they kick the door through him and Nick Hopewell to find out there's no other, there's nobody flying the plane. Um, it's on autopilot, but nobody's flying it. Um, so obviously the pilot then goes, kicks into pilot mode and tries to contact loads of people and see if there's anybody out there. Um, when he phones, what, phones, radios to the airports and everything, there's no reply. It's just static on all channels, even military channels, which have constantly got chatter on. Um, everything's just quiet. It's as if the planet has disappeared. Although right. They can see it, but They're functioning, but flying blind. Yes, exactly. Um, and then all while this happening, obviously there's this character called Craig Toomey, who is highly strung, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Again, played brilliantly in the TV movie. Um, probably the best bit about the TV movie, actually. Um, he, yeah, so he's highly strung. He's got a history of abuse from his father and his mother that's quite harrowing and really pulls on the heartstrings and makes you feel for this character, despite the, 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 the um, odious contempt he has for everybody else on the plane. Right. Uh, as humans, as a species, there's a lot of hatred going on in this guy. Um, yeah, because he starts off just obnoxious. Yeah. And he's basically threatening to sue everyone and he's obsessed with his business meeting in the morning. Yeah, in LA or Boston, I think it is, isn't it? Right, right. Um, and so he then accosts the pilot, Nick Engel, 
or not Nick Engel, the other guy. Brian. Yeah, Brian Engel. Um, and says, you need to take me here. Um, I'm not going anywhere else because by this point, Brian, the, the, the pilot has decided that they can't land at where they were going to originally go because because there's no, it appears that there's nobody but there. If there is somebody there, there'll be too much traffic and it's likely to call a right. massive accident over a populated space. So he decides, takes the executive decision to fly the plane to a lesser known airport that's going to be quieter where they can land, which is Bangor, Maine. Um, points if you can guess where this flight might be going yeah yeah Castle Rock <laughs> probably but yeah so he ends up in they, they, they go there um, and Craig Toomey's not happy about this so he tries to kick off and gets more and more agitated and then Nick Hopewell does this secret agent move which is grabbing by the nose <laughs> um, and threatens to punch the lights out so he backs down goes and sits down and then just stops tearing the paper the strips right, right. he does to calm himself down this is with the help of don gaffney obviously well, obviously but he takes him and sits him down and buckles him in and mm. he just sits there and stews for a bit and then you've got bob and albert our violinist student and bob the writer who are just spitballing about what's happened to themselves i have the fun with this one right the the writer especially yeah he um He's on the money. Yeah, <laughs> he literally comes up with a theory for, for every scenario. Yeah. It's pretty fun. He literally yeah. just, I don't know if he nails it. What if it's this, but what if it's that, but it could be this. Right, right, right. He's, he's almost monologuing a book he's writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're flying. They um, decide to go to Bangor, Maine, they land there. Um, they drop below the clouds. Obviously, there, there's a point where they fly over Denver and there's no lights on the surface. That's why they think that right, right. the big has gone on like a nuclear war or something. Mm. And they fly to Bangor, Maine, land at Bangor, Maine, through a, a, a series of, they drop below the clouds and there's some really bad turbulence that seems abnormal for turbulence because I've never been in turbulence that bad. Um, and then land at Bangor, Maine. Um, they get out the plane and everything is off. Right, and they don't quite know why. They, or, can't, they can't put their finger on it, right? They can't put their finger on it. The noise um, the there's something the very fundamentally wrong. Apart from the fact there's no people anywhere right. <laughs> in the entire airport. Um, and it's just, it's just bizarre. So they, they, they head into the airport to try and decide what to do next, find people, get some food, work stuff out. Um, and while they're heading from the plane to the airport, Dana, the blind girl, goes, can you hear this? Can you hear that sound? And, it, and she's not quite able to put a finger on what it is or where it's coming from, but there's a sound that's miles off in the distance because her senses are heightened. It sounds like um, Rice Krispie popping. That's right. Describes it. I'm not gonna lie. That was ludicrous. Yeah. Because but it is not only described as that, but it's described as that horrible sound, yeah. like the fish The serial sound. Um, but no, I, there's, what is a what is a counterpoint to your uh, mm, on the line is that from the perception of a child that would sound, that's what you would place it against. But if you're an adult, you would hear static electricity or something like that. Right, so right. Kind of really all, know. Yeah, so for her, that sounds like Rice Krispies popping because that's what she hears the most. Whereas for an adult, mm. she's probably stopped eating Rice Krispies and heard electricity static or something like that. I, I heard that somewhere. I thought, actually, that's quite a good point. Um, uh, but she can hear this sound and it sounds on them as she doesn't like it. It unsettles her to a very core. Cool, they head into the airport um, and then go up to a canteen area to to sit down, chill out and relax, find out what's going on and make, make a plan. And while they're all doing that, Craig Toomey decides I'm not having any of this. And then he disappears off with the chatter in his head and the madness going on. Right. Um, well, security we, office. we get the name of the Langoliers, right? Yeah, I think he's mentioned the Langoliers are coming or something like that. But so, at that point, they put it down to him just being mad because that's what his dad called uh, the beasts that ate up lazy children. 
Yeah, basically, his parents were particularly hard on him. Mm. And just bums and layabouts, he That's sort true. of gave him a fairy tale of that the, these people are just like worthless to society and will become nothing. And somehow the, the name Langoliers just came to represent not giving everything and failure. Yeah. And so Toomey's pretty baby and ranty in the airport and he's kind of showing that the Langoliers are going to come and get you. Yeah. And we, I think at this stage we get a sense that Dana kind of has the shining, right? Yeah. She, yeah. she kind of uh, knows what's going on with Toomey. Like when everyone else is pretty angry at him, she's like, you have to leave him alone. It's not his fault. Yeah. She can see the world through his eyes. Yes. And he thinks they're all ugly. Yeah. Um, which, again, that's why I think the, uh, the only difference between the TV movie and the book is the visualisation of that and what it happens to his vision of people. But um, So he's gone off to the security office to find a gun, uh, which he finds. Pockets and then, back, <laughs> and then heads back to the crew or to the rest of the people to extract uh, or demand that they fly him to Austin, right. where his meeting was. Um, and and while all he's heading back, to them, right? back to the main thing, Bob has come up with another ingenious theory that solves all their problems and answers mm -hmm. every question that they all have. Um, right. There's a whole thing with matches, and basically what it turns out is that the environment that they're in, or the world that they're in, um, the food tastes tasteless. It's right. not uh, tasteless. Right. The colours of the palette and the colours of the environment have just dimmed slightly. It's like everybody's just turned the lights off. Um, um, fuel, matches, and all that sort of thing don't light. They're sort of just... Uh, Right. Whereas uh, Bethany, who is a smoker in the book and the film, has a book of matches which she uses to light a cigarette that she's smoking. And her matches work fine. But anything from the the um the world that they've uh, they've landed in just doesn't do the same, doesn't act the same. Right. Um, everything same. everything from the plane is functioning, it's, but everything outside is yeah. Flat. Being better days. Um, so then they come to this conclusion that something is going on that with the, the area they're at. Craig Tooney rocks up with his gun, um, takes Bethany hostage, um, demands to be flown to do 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 do. Nick Hope, I was like, nobody move, nobody move, nobody hit him, like, leave him. Albert's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to listen, but I'm going to hold my violin case to my side and use it as a bat when I'm ready. Oh, here's the sign, Bethany bites. Mr. Toomey's arm, right. um, Albert steps in with his violin case like some heroic knight and goes to clobber Mr. Toomey with it, but gets shot. The gun it goes off. Toomey takes a violin head to the case to the head, goes down. Albert goes down with the bullet wound, or as we think is a bullet wound, but it turns out because the gun was from the time period or the world that they're in, um, there was no ignition. So the bullet right. was, was out yeah. and bounces off his chest and just lands on the floor um, yeah. with a pathetic whimper. Um, and Albert's fine. Um, Mr. Toomey, not so much. Got a bruise to the right. head. Uh, and uh, old Nick Hopewell ties him up with a piece of rope. Um, and then they decide to split and go off and do different things. I can't remember exactly what happens there, but Dana then has another, oh, can you hear the sound? It's getting closer, it's getting closer. We can stay and watch Toomey because he's tied yeah. up. Yeah, um, so Dana has the, has the, here's the sound, and then right. wanders off, and then a load of them go with her, and then a couple stay behind to listen to check on Toomey, make sure he doesn't right. try to do anything dodgy. Um, so they all go off, and that's when she says that her famous line, the serial sound, can you hear the serial sound? Oh, okay, right. Um, probably... It sounds a bit more like a, like static electric or something mm -hmm. like that, because um, they can just start to faintly hear it in the background. Yeah, they haven't really trusted her. Mm. At least half of them have just thought she's she's a blind, scared girl. 
she's just you know, she's like 12 I think she's like, right right yeah um um so the people that are supposed to be looking after Craig Toomey do a bad job he right. gets away <laughs> and goes to hide um and then Bethany, uh, no, the, the teacher lady and Dana decide to go back and check on Mr. Toomey because the people that were supposed to be looking after him had come down to see what was going on. So right. they're mesmerized by this incoming sound mm. um, while Dana, the blind girl, and the teacher woman go off to check on Mr. Toomey. When they get back there, he's gone, but mm. Dana can hear him or sense him and she goes, be careful, he's over there behind the, the thing. And so she starts to walk up to him and say, uh, Mr. Toomey, it's okay, You're, it's fine and everything. The whole while he's getting the voice of his dad going, you're just rubbish, you're lazy, the Langoliers are going to come and get you and eat you. You're going to amount to nothing, you need to get to Boston, this meeting is so important. Right. Um, so this chat is going on in his head, he goes slowly more and more mad, grabs a knife off the side and charges Dana, <laughs> rams a blade into her chest mm. and legs it. He's not doing much to help the team. Nor his own causes, no. Um, yeah. so Dana goes down with the blade in her. Um, Toomey runs off and hides. And right. everybody else comes back and, oh, my God, oh, my God, we need to do this. So Nick Hopewell um, charges Don Gaffney and the other guy, or I can't remember his name, Albert, the gotcha. violinist, to go and find a stretcher. Um, right. And the plan is to, to get back on the plane. Yeah, they've decided they're going to get back on the plane, um, refuel, take off, and try and find somewhere else to land. Um, right. So they do an experiment, right? Like they take some of the matches that mm. don't work and yeah. on the aeroplane. I think that is that happening while. I think that's paralleling when. Yeah, that's paralleling where, where, where Dana are in a bandage and everything kind of thing. So, so yeah, Brian Eagle, Bob. No, because Albert goes out to the plane as well, doesn't he? I think that comes slightly after. I don't know. Okay, yeah. But yeah, so there's a group, they, Nick Hopewell charges a couple with them to go and find some stretchers. Right. Um, they bandage up Dana by moving her around with the blood because the blade's quite deep. She's still mm -hmm. alive, but the blade's quite deep. Take the blade out, bandage her up and everything. Um, all the while, Don Gaffney and this other Albert are going in, who's got a toaster in the end of a pillowcase type thing in his, for a weapon, because they don't know where, obviously, to me Maybe is. Prison style. Um, and they go into a room that just happens to be the same room that Toomey went into. Um, Don Gaffney goes in first, and Albert, just slowly following in, notices on the corner of the table strips of paper that have been torn out of a magazine in a pile. And he instantly right. knows that Craig Toomey was in the room. Right. Cause he um, and screams out to Don, he's in here. Mm. Obviously, Craig Toomey by this point is behind the door, comes out and stabs him as well. Mm. Um, and then turns the blade on to Albert, who's backing out the room. They're obviously doing this sort of thing. Um, and he's swinging his little toaster in a... <laughs> lumps him around the head with it. Um, lumps him a couple more times, caves his face in and proper leaves him just mashed on the floor. He goes and spews up. Um, and then Nick Hopewell comes down from fixing Dana up top um, and goes into the room, gets a stretcher with Albert, checks on Don, who's dead, um, sends Albert up with a stretcher. And Mr. Toomey is still on the floor. Um, and before Nick Hopewell left Dana up top, he, she said, don't you kill him, don't you kill him, we need him, don't you kill him, promise me you won't kill him. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. And then when he gets down there, he's going to kill him because he sent off Albert with the stretcher. And as he goes to suffocate him, he hears Dana's voice in his head saying, don't kill him, we need him. Mm. So he just stops and leaves him. A right. whole while this is happening, on the plane, Brian, the pilot, and a couple of other people, I can't remember the names of, um, are on there and they've come up they've formulated an idea that the stuff from the plane okay right this is where this comes in yeah the, the stuff on the plane is still working and from a present time mm -hmm. and the stuff outside the plane is from the past so right. the writer guys formulated this idea that the world that they've landed in 
is the past and it just left it's empty everybody's moved on um into another version of the of time right so, and everything's gone with it but stuff has stayed behind and it's just because it's because it's in the past it's no it doesn't need its taste it doesn't need its color it doesn't need anything it's just all right. fading out of existence basically. i think something i guess mildly key is at the beginning there's little talks of you can see the aurora um, yeah, we're and, yes they're skeptical of because it's that low down mm -hmm. and that's kind of his theory yeah yes yeah, it's, it's a rip in time in essence and they travel through this rip in time to the past but only by 15 minutes i think it was or half an hour or something but while they're there in the past and all of this is happening day to night cycles are getting quicker especially that right. one it sort of goes when when they land that it was like a couple of hours later but um to them it feels like it's mid-afternoon and then it feels like it's evening and that sort of thing really really quickly mm -hmm. um, but on the plane they they work out that if they were to bring stuff from that time the, the outside the plane time onto the plane mm. it catches up with the present right a couple of minutes and then so, so they've got beer that's flat but they open it on the plane and then after a while the bubbles appear the flavor comes back right I think um, it's something like we the present. Our own, we bought our own pocket of time mm -hmm. yeah it will work for us exactly so that's that's how they get around the fact that the fuel that they're pumping onto the plane is from the past and mm -hmm. probably won't ignite because none of it works like the matches didn't but because they're pumping it into the present or their pocket of time which is the present after a while it will become normal fuel and then right but there's a kind of they hope time pressure right like they don't trust that it's going to last forever they, they right. kind of make haste yes so all this time while well, Bethany, no, Dana's been stabbed and being fixed and they're on the plane working out what the hell's going on and why the fuel will work and why everything, what they're planning is going to work. The sound of the cereal is getting closer and closer and closer. Mm. Um, so close, in fact, that they feel like they've, they've only got like less than a couple of hours and it's going to take at least two hours to fill the plane with enough fuel. So right. they make haste, they speed along their processes. Um, and bring Dana out to the plane, get her on the plane. Um, right, because they haven't... Um, fuel and everything, and the whole time, Toomey still unconscious, but is alive in the, in the airport. Um, and the serial sound is getting closer and closer and closer. So Dana, while the plane is being refueled, really starts calling out to Toomey because the serial sound is getting so close Mm. that she's starting to worry along with everybody else and tells Craig Coom to me now is the time you need to get up you need to go to the board meeting the board are here they've come all the way from Boston to Bangor Maine to right. enable you to achieve your goal of telling them that you've swindled them out of 40 million pounds and you did it deliberately and you want the sack so that you can be free of this constant and utter pressure that you find yourself on under from your dad from the work from everything from society you will be free of all of that because you've screwed them all over you can right. laugh in their faces and leave so he is like okay um that that's exactly what i can't believe you've managed to happen who are you are you the angel of light and she's like yes i'm the angel of light and this is all being done psychopathically with the shine um so he stumbles up with his caved in face and battered bruised ribs and everything crawls out of the airport the sound is getting closer and closer and closer and it's on the on the horizon now so trees are starting to be pulled pylons are coming down you can just see the horizon slowly disappearing right um, he starts to get out out of the airport hits the tarmac the plane is being fueled and they've still got a little bit of time before the fuel is going to be enough to get them back through the rip and then home um Dana's like, run, you fool, run. We need you, we need you. Craig Toomey starts running across the tarmac. The Langoliers appear as the most bizarre end of movie book bad guy I think I've ever read or heard or seen in my entire life. 
<laughs> uh, I, I don't know what you want to say on the on the Langoliers, but so basically, from the horizon, they see these dots, Bonkers. and when they come clear, they are, um, I guess, maybe three or four times the size of a, like a big beach ball, like yeah. a giant beach ball, and they just sort of open up with rows and rows and rows of teeth, yeah, and well. they kind of fly. And they just eat everything up. And they just, yeah, they, they strip the land, basically. Um, right. In, 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 like, strips. So I get one langolier will take a coming. small section of, of the land while mm. it eats it. And another so langolier will take another strip. Yeah, like that land, exactly right. like that. Landscape. Um, that's a great way of just describing the langoliers. Like, <laughs> three d pat men with metal teeth. Right. Um, one's red and one's blue. That's how it's described in the book. And they, they basically eat the, the, the environment. Um, at that point, there's only two of them. They're sort of crisscrossing and doing this and bouncing and just mm -hmm. munching everything. And then um, they're heading towards the plane. The fuel has just finally reached its what they needed to get in. They decouple the plane. The Langoliers are chomping away in the scenery. Everybody's like, oh my God, what the hell is going on? Where's where's the strip gone? Where's the build? Where's the trees? Where's and then um Craig Toomey runs past him going, ah, I've right. got to get to my board. He gets on the board, he gets to the board table, which has just magically appeared in this environment at the end of the um runway because it's a, a shine apparition. Of right. and the madness of Pumi. Um, and he runs out, gets to the board meeting, tells them what he's done at this board meeting. The Langoliers see him, and that's the distraction, enough of a distraction um, for them on the plane to start the plane and get it moving. Right. The Langoliers they turn, they turn, turn up. for Toomey. Hmm? So they turn, and, they turn and go for Toomey. Yeah, they turn and go for Toomey. Toomey to then. Um, sort of snaps out of his vision, I guess. Um, right. The plane starts moving, realises that it was all a lie and that the Langoliers are literally there right in front of him, about to chomp and turns and runs. Um, and while he's running away, the Langoliers eat his ankles. <laughs> right. Uh, he, <laughs> so he falls over and his ankles are gone. There's no blood or anything. It's cauterised perfectly, but it's just like as if they were never there. Right. Um, and then he slowly gets munched away by these Langoliers. And then... While the plane's running off down the runway, loads, millions of Langoliers start right. stripping the environment away, closing in around them, like, right. just <laughs> coming at them from all directions. This plane's hurtling down the runway. Langoliers are like in the windows down either side, just stripping the environment away, crisscrossing in front of the plane. The plane, like, has to fly over the, or no, just run over this piece of runway that was there and suddenly isn't because the Langoliers are like, poof, poof, as it does. And then just before it gets to the end of the runway, into the sky as the Langoliers come underneath. Right, um, get the watch woof. from the sky. So close. And, and then they're in the sky and they've plotted a reverse path of what they took to get to where they were. So they're hoping that by following it exactly on the way back, um, they will fly through what they flew through to get them there and they'll rejoin their time. That's their thinking. So they head there. Um, back the way they came, basically. Yeah, back the way they came. Unfortunately, Dana then dies from her wounds. Um, but she got to see, she's happy because she got to see through the eyes of Craig Toomey. Um, and so they're flying. And they're about to fly through this, this, this hole when they find it in space and time again. And the writer guy's like, no, stop, you can't. Nick Hope, I was like, look, it's too late, we're doing it, sit down. And he goes, no, you don't understand, you fools, you fools, you, you're going to get us all killed. We were asleep. And then Nick Hope, I was like, oh, body shot to the chest. You're right. Oh, crap. Gets up, legs it up to the front of the plane. Brian, you've got to cancel. We need to get out of here because... We were, well, you just need to do it. Um, we were asleep and he's like, oh yeah. And they like, the plane just at the last minute arcs out, misses the hole and they circle round for a bit, trying to work out how the hell they're all going to get to sleep so that they can fly back through the, the gap and then wake up on the other side to land the plane. Right. 
Um, and they think about like uh, crushing pills, everybody drinking sleeping pills, and, and, and the, 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 the pilots like, we haven't got enough time for everybody to fall asleep, and they only work if you're tired, and none of us are tired. Um, so that's not going to work. Um, and they try and explore, and they're virtually almost out of ideas, and then Albert says something about pressure, and the pilot's like, oh my God, we could do this. If, we, if I reduce the pressure to seven PSI or something like that, everybody on the plane will faint. Um, we can fly through, and, it will, and then it will be fine. And then the woman's like, but how do we wake up on the other side? Um, we need somebody to flick the switch to put the pressure back so we all wake up. Um, and then Nick's like, well, somebody's going to have to stay alive, stay awake to flick the switch. Um, he picks himself. Right. There's a and bit of a romance thing going on between him and the teacher. Yeah, they kind of hit it off. Yeah, they kind of yeah, warm to each other throughout the book. Um, and then, yeah, so he stays awake. Everybody else goes to sleep because he drops the pressure. He has a gas mask on. And just as he flies through, and they fly through the Borealis again, he's like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Flick, poof, disappears. All right. of his jewellery and stuff fall to the ground. And after about half an hour, everybody else starts to wake up. Um, they fly back to LA, land, go to land at LA, but when they're talking on the chatter again, still no return, no people. Right. Um, yeah, it's still exactly the same as it was in the last place, but they were hoping something would be different. So they land at LA. Um, but some of them are kind of convinced, right? Like the rider is pretty confident. And we, at this stage, know there's only about 20 pages left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so they land at LA and uh, they go into the airport, basically a repeat of what they did at the beginning. And but the food tastes good, the drink tastes good, everything tastes like it should, or mm. everything looks the way it should, everything sounds the way it should, everything, the, the wind is blowing, it's as it should be, apart mm. from the fact that there's no people, and all they can hear on the horizon is this ah sound, this constant mm. ah getting closer, yeah. closer, but yeah. then scared of it for some reason, Whereas they were terrified of the, the serial sound, mm -hmm. this one, they just kind of accept it. Um, and then they're at a point where they don't really have an awful lot of choice. They've just flown about all over the place. Right. Um, the writer then comes up with a, another amazing grasp of imagination and goes, I've got an idea. I think I know what's happening, but we need to be quick. Follow me. So they all follow him through this empty airport and he stands against a wall on a runway, uh, not a runway, on a, a walkway, but where they all stand with their backs against the walkway. Um, and he just says, stay here, wait. Um, and we're, hopefully, if I'm right, something will happen. And then after a couple of minutes, the shadows and ghosts start to appear in the environment, moving quickly. Sound, this ah sound starts to stop being an ah and starts to break into sort of the sounds of conversations and people chatting and people walking and you know dust carts being moved and all that sort of thing and then the, that becomes more or less translucent and more solid and more solid and more solid to the point where then the people that are on the plane catch of the future so they've jumped into the future by 15 right. minutes and the future has caught up with them um, and then they rejoin the present time and whew, everything's okay and that kind of in a nutshell is the Langoliers. Yeah, I think so. It's kind of a happy ending for them. Yeah. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a bit of a wrap up from the writer, right? The writer who is sort of philosophizing mm -hmm. and being correct a lot, sort of wraps the book up. Um, yeah, the end. The end. Doesn't sound like much, but like that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, but, um, well, not, and, and there is an awful lot to it to be perfectly honest with you but it's it's simple but mm. it works what it reads so quickly as well what's your thoughts of overall overall i i i thoroughly enjoyed it i read it really quickly like i said um normally it would take me quite a while to read a book obviously we're in lockdown and i've got a load of 
blooming time on my hands, so I read it relatively quickly. But it felt like I was reading old school Stephen King. Mm. It is old school Stephen King, but it felt like I was reading old school Stephen King. Um, I thought the characters were really good. The dialogue was brilliant. Uh, the, 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 the dialogue was interesting at times. Um, yes, at other times. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah. It just was a simple tale. What I really, what I, what grasped me was the idea of everything disappearing, landing in a place that the, that the setup was brilliant in this book. Mm. Yeah. That, I think that, um, more than the ending, the ending, the payoff with all Stephen King's, and I think maybe that's a testament to horror in itself. The the ending was difficult sell like when the langoliers turned up and there's a red blue red red blob and a blue blob with teeth mm. um it felt like the red car and the blue car had a race from that old milky way advert, but <laughs> but with teeth all <laughs> <laughs> um, the red car wanted to do with stuff his face yeah yeah exactly um it was good though yeah mm. i enjoyed it like this is probably the most fun i've had reading on appears for a while mm -hmm. uh very kind of old school, very Twilight Zone-ish. Yeah. Um, the, the copy I had had a little intro to his, uh, where yeah, it came it, from. This one, yeah. Right, and he said, I think he's quite scared of flying. Mm -hmm. There was a crack in a wall on a plane he was flying at, and he just um, couldn't stop staring at it for an entire uh, flight. Yeah. And uh, it sort of came from there. I'd like to retell a bit of the story from a bit of a perspective shift. Yeah. Because I'm going to put out there that Toomey was, although quite murderous and mm -hmm. uh, violent and psychotic, he was also kind of a victim to, um, I don't know, mental disability and mm -hmm. clearly some kind of schizophrenia. And that Dana, the blind 12 year old, is kind of the human villain for this book. Because. It's good. I feel like she uses this mentally ill man's schizophrenia to convince him to run to his death to be eaten alive so they could save their lives. Yeah. And I don't know how I feel about that, really. This is exactly what she does. It's pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. I get that he's not, he's, you know, he's kind of the villain unstable. But we also get the feeling it's not, you know, he's a circumstance of, of his upbringing. And, um, you know, some form of system, to be nurture sure. This is nurture thing, isn't it? Right. But for her to play into his um, schizophrenia, to make him <laughs> leave I, I, the danger I, away, that's kind of cold-blooded. If, if he hadn't plunged a blade into her, mm. I'd agree with you. But because he basically killed her... That's true. She's got... I, I, I think she's got every right to go... <laughs> fucking go out there and beat yourself on to survive this shit. <laughs> yeah, but at least for him, we we know it's bad. For her, we get a yes. There's no regret. <laughs> no, no. Really? She, 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 yeah, that's true. Um, and that's uh, that's something he's done a few times, where the big payoff was uh, came down to very minute detail. Mm -hmm. Like in this case. Um, the payoff for, for Toomey and Dana was she needed to stay him literally a few minutes so they could get away by a few minutes. Yeah. And um, I guess that's something we talked about in the film last week of The Shining, where Dick Halloran goes a long, long way traveling to be kind of killed off instantly. Yeah, there's um, enough time for him to get them to get away. Right. Mm. Um, and that, that kind of, that's what this reminded me of. Like, yeah. you know. The, but this, like I said last week as well, the to me, I felt for to me. I did mm -hmm. feel up until the well, for the most part, all the way through. But um, until he stabbed Dana, especially, um, you, you, he was really struggling. There was glimmers of a person in there that didn't mm -hmm. want to be the person that he was being forced to be. That he'd been right. He was be. kind of beyond his control, right? I mean. Almost, uh, I guess, if we're playing into The Shining and pre-control, his whole life led up to that moment, <laughs> so they could, he could save those random bunch of people. Yeah, same with um, Kuku, same with um, Jack Torrance. Mm. Just there's 
a multitude of characters. And it did feel like if you took a house where all the family members read a bit and there's, you know, say the youngest kid is 15. Mm -hmm. and you shook the house upside down to see what literary characters fell out of all the different books. He put those all in this one story because we have, uh, you know, a pilot, we yeah. have a British agent, yeah. uh, uh, a writer, yeah. uh, a drug adult teen, yeah. blind girl, and it all felt like they were from a different genre melded together in this. Yeah. Uh, they didn't always feel like they should be there individually. Mm. Um, and for me, one of the, it's kind of strange, no one took the lead role in this. You well, kind of uh, pilot will be, but then he steps back. Yeah, he, he, did, he literally talks role. about that in the book as well, doesn't he? I don't recollect that. The decision to step back. So he, he takes the lead, Brian takes the lead for the plane and the piloting side of things. Right, right, yeah. He, like, now mm. I'm done. Stop asking me questions. Oh, okay, right, right. Because he has no answers. He's just the pilot, right? Yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. Um, but despite all those sort of morale of characters, it does kind of come full circle. Everyone's use plays in, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's one character we didn't talk about because he has so little to do. And he's always played for jokes because he's sleeping. Yeah. He'll literally right. sleep through the whole book and yeah. nap in and out without any stress. But he's the reason why the writer remembers that they have to be asleep. He walks yeah. past them snoring and he wonders, how can he be sleeping? <gasps> sleeping is the key. Yeah, um, that's exactly it. Yes, well remembered. It's, he, he, his, his, his character is literally there to do just that. That's right, right. The only purpose he is there is to remind them just before they fly through that mm. they need to be asleep because he dies. He does? Yeah, you, you know, it doesn't, because he, 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 when they get thrown about through the, uh, through the turbulence, he smashes his oh, head. Oh, of course, head. yes. And then he doesn't end up in the future, does he? Mm. He doesn't off the plane with them or anything, I don't think. Mm. It's, uh, it's a fun book, I'll give it that. It's very, uh, it kind of creates a playground in its world. There's stuff like, um, you know, they can't get off the plane, they have to pull the emergency slide. And there's yeah. a bit of like, you go first, no, you go first. And, and yeah. I think that's when the pilot's like, I don't want to be in charge, you, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can't just get into the airport, they have to climb through the, the yeah. luggage uh, yeah. vendor. And just little stuff like that just, just makes it this strange, empty playground. But it, it, what, so what surprised me about the transition from book to film was the fact that, like we said earlier on, it's three hours long. You wouldn't have thought that that story would make a three hour film. No. But, but it, it, it is so faithful in its recreation of the story. Mm. Right? There's virtually all the lines, the dialogue lines in the book are in the film. Right, it's like a page just a couple or two, one or two here and there. But for the whole, everything that's said by characters in the book is said in the in the TV show. And in the book, it worked for me. The dialogue was good. It didn't feel clunky. It just flowed. Yeah, but you can kind of the TV movie. In the TV movie, it was absolute junk. Oh, it really? You didn't enjoy it? it. I particularly enjoyed this film. But I do agree it's junk. It did feel like they had a week to shoot the entire movie and whatever your first take was, that's what we're going with. Um, yeah. And I, I guess the film more so than the book. But why do you think that is? Why do you think reading the script as it was in here mm. works, but when you put it on screen and get people to deliver the lines, it sounds just awful. Yeah, because it's not always good dialogue. Like there's, there's things that, like when you're reading, you can forgive quirks from characters. The writer always refers to the violinist as my dear boy. Yes. And it doesn't particularly get tiresome, but when you're watching it, you know, like I was saying, it sort of brings to attention more that mm -hmm. this, this guy is from a sort of self protective <laughs> novel, mm. you know, and the, um, the woman who is on the date is more from a, not a Harlequin novel, but but like a, a romance novel. Yeah. Um, the British assassin guy is more from sort of James Patterson novel. Yeah. Like the, I think the acting, the hearing those lines out loud more than in your head. 
brings you to the attention of how no one speaks like anyone that kind of says anything in yeah. the it's weird, isn't it? I think I find that's what I found the most interesting when watching a TV movie was how mm. the lines just don't work. But they mm. work in the story in a book, but they just do not work when said out loud. My dear boy. Yeah. Nobody says yeah. that. But in the book, it sounds <laughs> just right. Everything was fine. Yeah. But I guess for something so short and so many characters who have one thing to give, like you said with the sleeping guy, everyone does give that one thing and it comes around, right? Like the, like there's a reason for things. The, the, the Everything alien, in that book happens for a reason, yeah. The reason that the British man is like um, a secret agent is because at the end, someone needs to sacrifice himself to save them. Mm -hmm. And he, as an agent, has killed people and he just kind of thinks, well, I'm, you know, it's balancing this my world, out. I can balance this out. Mm. Um, and without that, you know what I mean? Everyone brings a little bit of purpose, yeah. even the violinist, you know, mm. gets, gets his moment. Um, he has quite a few moments, actually, the violinist. Yeah, it's, like I said, everyone feels like you could, re, you could just shift the whole book to have them as the star. Yeah. But he refused to. <laughs> yeah. So everyone, everyone takes their spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, for me, I would say equally, no one stars in this book which I guess is good. Yeah. Well, I guess it's good it's short <laughs> as a result. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see. What I, I didn't really read any reviews on the book, whether it's considered something that is past good. I know all over the book, there's blurbs that yeah. say these four stories are, are great and stuff. Mm. Um, you know, I, we should probably check on when it was written, but it does have that very... Uh, it, it was written between, uh, I think it's 86 and 87, the four stories were written. And then it was released in 88. Okay. And What's then the, the movie was... Before, this time, what was this, what was before and after this in his publishing timeline? So this is the, the second short story novels that he released. So before this was Carrie Salem's Lot, The Shining, Night's Shift, The Stand, and then this. Oh, uh, okay. Um, and that, that's out of his... Uh, oh, that, that was... That's a lie, actually. He also had Christine, Pet Symmetry, It, Misery, Tommy Knockers, Dark Half, and the Stand Complete Uncut Edition had been produced, released as well. Uh, okay. But there's a good chance he wrote these books throughout that time, right? I know, at least in his, his particular short stories one, he talks about where they were published and yeah. all over this. I think at that time, Playboy were picking up a lot of his shorts, right? Yeah, there was a few of them appeared in there, yeah. Quite a sp sporadic uh, publishing of his, yeah. Um, but overall, I, I would give this a ludicrously high rating, like eight and a half to nine. <laughs> Brilliant. I, I, yeah, I can't really put my finger on why I enjoyed it so much, other than I guess it doesn't take its, it's quite tongue in cheek and it doesn't take itself too seriously. So it has fun with it, mm -hmm. but it still kind of has that tension and it has that mystery, whether it's your thing or not. I, I wonder if a lot of people reading this when the language Lears manifested, didn't know what to make of it, but they're also dealt with and they don't really come back. They're just mm -hmm. the episode of, of uh, those three chapters. Mm -hmm. um, again, in the film, uh, I guess it really shows their lack of budget. It, there is some uh, pretty horrendous CGI for, the, for that what, era. What do you think is, um, like when you watch it, <laughs> this is like, like not necessarily a book question, but more of a film question. Why is it clear that that's a TV movie or made for TV movie um, versus a made for cinema movie? Oh, well, just the, the, the level of polish by far. I mean, this... Because um, it was shot with good film cameras and everything. Shot on, it? Yeah, it was shot on film and everything. I've seen behind the scenes shots and stuff. That kind of does surprise me. I mean, it felt very flat. And maybe that was an intentional thing because of the world they were living in. But when they're not in that world, it still feels quite flat. Mm -hmm. um, it's For me, a lot of it is down to there's no movement in the camera. Right, it's a lot of lockdown, right? It's all, yeah, pretty much all lockdown, yeah. static shots, people walking through shots. And I think that's the thing that separates TV movies from proper 
especially in the 90s anyway, from films. Because mm. the movement in camera, there's just none of it. It's like pans yeah. or tilts, but no zooms, tracks or any of that sort of thing. I mean, King is kind of famous for having unfilmable or very tricky to film. I mean, I don't think you could make this in modern times with, with the VFX of, of modern times mm. and make it good. No, um, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't think the <laughs> There's something hokey, I suppose, about the whole concept. Mm -hmm. um, a good TV episode, for sure. I, I mean... Um, it's the perfect thing for yeah. a, I can't sleep at half 12, one in the morning, yeah. I'll just stick something on and, oh my God, what is this? I might fall asleep, no, I won't fall asleep, I'll watch it all and then I'll fall asleep. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the book. Our intention is to read the other three, yeah. three stories. So, uh, hopefully gonna, so I'd give it, I'd give the Langoliers um, a seven and a half. Mm. I'd say seven, seven and a half, seven, somewhere around there. Um, what I like about it is it doesn't have a religious nut in it. No. <laughs> I, 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 for some reason, that's one of the reasons why I haven't read The Mist is because I've seen the TV, with the, mm. the film with The Mist, and the religious nuts in Stephen King books really annoy me. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's true. The, I guess there's uh, a fair amount of philosophizing in this one, and it's strange how in, um, in 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 other books of this sort of caliber, when you get the philosophizers, it feels like it. You come out going, "Oh, you never really get an answer." Mm. But at one point, this character philosophizes this, so there's a hint. But then there's also this. This one, his philosophizing, kind of turns out accurate yeah so, I, but the, the, the writing uh, we're kind of meant to believe oh that's maybe what's happening but also shown yeah that's that's kind of exactly what's happening yeah yeah he, he is uh, yeah mm. it's it's like he turned the narrator who who is the the, the vision like the all-knowing god mm -hmm. and just put him in it yeah it is a, it, it is a flat-out horror i'd say uh, you think? I, I yeah. guess, but very old school. Mm. Very, um, you know, uh, Twilight Zone y, mm -hmm. um, sci fi horror. Yeah. It, suffers, it suffers from what he wrote about in On Writing, um, the, or Dance Macabre, one of the two, um, where the art of good horror is to keep the door, the door locked. Mm. But and build up to what's behind the door. And then when you open the door, that's when generally horror goes wrong because the reveal is always less than the anticipation and what the audience will put in their own mind. So mm. they'll project what they think is behind the door mm. um, throughout reading the, the story. And then once you open the door, it invariably doesn't live up to their expectations because they put it on a platitude or something like that. Right, right. Um, and I think that's, that's what this suffers from is that, like the sound and the build up to the language is then being on the horizon, seeing the horizon crumpling and disappearing is foreboding, mm. it's terrifying. But then you get these red and blue blobs that pop out and <laughs> just jump away right. in scenery. And you're like, ah. Oh. I mean, it's I guess scarier. It's more adventure than it is horror. Because mm -hmm. we don't, I'm pretty sure there's no real graphic. I guess when the young girl gets stabbed is the most graphic. And, and uh, Toomey's face being caved in with his nose smashed up and stuff like that. Oh, that's true, yeah, and he does lose that, a leg. That's really quite nasty at times. Mm. But, yeah. Um, I no, think I'm I'm a, yeah, seven, seven and a half. Yeah, I mean, it's just got a charm. And yeah. It's quite hard to not like, whether it's whether you see it as its ridiculousness or, or its intrigue. It just has a, a certain charm about it. It's the, it's the B-movie of films, two books. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I don't know if that's something he'd be proud of, but <laughs> I don't know. I guess he knows who he is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to read Secret Window next, and hopefully yeah. that's what we're reviewing. Secret Window, Secret Garden. Yes. Um, Which is a Johnny Depp film. Yes, you said I, I've never heard of that one. I intend before. to watch that this week at some point, mm. um, after I finish the book, obviously. 
Uh, I have seen the film before, but okay. Do you not know? Do you know the story at all? I'm about thirty pages in, so I, I guess I'm in with the setup. Do you know you'd be so start from the beginning? Start from the bang, yeah. which is quite nice because this is shorter than the Langley is. This is about yeah. this is under two hundred pages. Yeah, something like that. And it, no, you start, don't know the ending to this story at the moment. No, okay. uh, I have no clue. Like it starts with a bang, which is pretty enjoyable. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, it does. It does set up the. Huh? Really well. <laughs> right, right. Like, I guess we'll talk about next week, but I'm 30 pages in. I go, yeah, I don't know what the problem is, though. Yeah, I, I see what's happening, but, you know, yeah, so? <laughs> like, forget yeah, about it. Exactly. But, yeah, the next um, 140 odd pages will let us know. Yes, indeed. All right. Um, we don't have bingo this week, so we're not doing bingo anymore. We've dropped bingo. No, it, it doesn't seem to be working. And I did forget to say, spoilers be here at the beginning. Yes, but never mind. I'll put it in the title. You probably know already. Yeah, put it in the title. Um, okay, cool. Well, is that it? We done? You got anything else you want to say? No, I, I mean, yeah, I'm Langoloid out. All Langoloid out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. All okay, right. well, thank you very much for watching. For watching, yeah. yeah. Uh, support your local bookstores and keep yeah. reading. Share this video uh, if you want to. All right. Any other Stephen King fans? Hello, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Bye.